So about six months ago, um, I became complacent. We all become complacent at times. Unfortunately, I became complacent when I was using a table saw. Um, and I managed to cut through three and a half of the fingers on my left hand, uh, which was quite an experience. The middle finger here actually cut all the way through to the other side, and these other two I cut through to the bone. Um, and amazingly, uh, a local hand surgeon managed to put it all back together, which is unbelievable to me. Certainly when I see the original pictures, which I'm not gonna show you because <laughs> it is just before lunch. Um, the, uh, yeah, they put it all together, but unfortunately they cannot put the nerves back. And so I have to regrow the nerves that go to my fingers. And the amazing, and again, I didn't know this happened, uh, they are regrowing. They start off from somewhere up here and they travel all the way down and they grow into my fingers and they knit together. The bad news is that when they knit, my brain has no idea what each individual wire does, right? It's just a random wire that comes out of here and it's attached to some kind of sensor and does something. So as part of my uh, physical therapy, I had, and I still have, this job of touching things. I have to train my brain. I have to go and I have to touch things that are hot, things that are cold, things that are rough, things that are smooth. And consciously think as I do that, ah, that's hot, that's cold. Because if I don't do that, it's really strange. I can touch something that's hot and it will feel rough. So I have to kind of like train my brain to relearn what my hand does. Now, whenever I think about table saw accidents, obviously, I think about babies. <laughs> because this baby is doing exactly what I have to do. Because when it's born, it really has no idea about what its hands are, what its feet are. And to learn, it makes all of these seemingly random movements. And in doing those movements, it begins to build a picture of you know, how its hands actually can be moved. It touches things and it learns hot, cold, rough, smooth, just like I have to with my hand. And that is so, so cool. Okay, I'm a, I'm a software developer, I'm a programmer. And I love looking at this because in a way, this is like the basic programming. This is the lowest level of programming we can possibly do. Right? forming all these connections in our brain. Now, after a while, you get to be able to control this. You learn that you, know, you can move your hand to a certain place, you can point, you can touch. And once you can do that, you can start experimenting with a bigger world. As an infant, your world is basically constrained to a sphere the size of your, of your reach. But now, I can touch things. I can say, I wonder what happens when I touch this. If you've had children, you know that that's one of the more annoying things that they can do. <laughs> but you learn this, and you go around and you touch things. And, hey, this makes a noise when I touch it. And in doing that, you're programming yourself again. You're learning new ways to make things happen, and that is so cool. Eventually, once you've learned how to touch and how to direct that touch, you can work with other people, and they can show you stuff. like. I can play your favorite song if you push this button and this button and this button. And maybe you want to play along. It all requires these steps to build up. Maybe you're inspired by this process as a baby. And maybe you say, it's, this is really cool. I like this. And maybe you have the discipline and the, the passion to want to learn. And at this point, you can start to become self-directed. You can start to do it on your own. Obviously, you'll still need people to help you, but you can actually develop. You can still build these reflexes, build this knowledge in your head of what it means, for example, to play the piano. This can be a frustrating period. I mean, everybody who has learned anything complicated will have gone through the phase of, you know, why am I doing this? This used to be easy. I used to have fun, and now it's hard. Now I've bumped into this, this, this problem. What can I do? 
And if you overcome this, if you convince yourself that no, you're actually just as good as you were, this has just got harder because it is, then maybe you reach this level where you get fulfillment from doing it, where you get mastery, but that mastery is not the real point. The real point is that you individually have become fulfilled by doing what you're doing. Okay, I'm a computer programmer, so why am I even talking about this? I'm also not a pianist anymore. Um, so why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this because uh, one of the things I do is I love teaching, and I love writing books about things, but mostly I love getting people passionate about things. And I started thinking about how this process all works, how we go through these different stages in our gathering of experience, in our learning. Because if we understand that, then maybe we can understand a little bit better how we teach people. And maybe we can make that experience a more rewarding one for both teacher and student. Some of the more influential work on this was done back in the early 80s by two brothers, Stuart and Hubert Dreyfus. Uh, one was a philosopher, the other one was an operational researcher. Uh, obvious team to work together. Uh, they were commissioned by the United States Air Force to investigate why it was so hard to teach pilots skills. So the Air Force had all these expensive facilities, money was no object, and they were trying to drum these skills into pilots, and the pilots just weren't getting it. So the two of them produced a 18-page paper. It's available on the net, it's declassified. It was titled, The Five-Stage Model of the Mental Activities Involved in Directive Skill Acquisition. It's now just called the Dreyfus Model of Skill Acquisition. It is a very, I mean, I would recommend everybody go out and read this. 18 pages, big type, uh, it's not, not hard. And it's also quite well written. In this paper, they say that people go through five stages in the process of learning something, becoming an expert or a master in something. This has been much misunderstood because people say, you know, there's obviously not five stages. How can there be you know, exactly five stages? And there aren't. It's not like one day you wake up and this big hand comes down through the clouds and gives you a certificate to say, congratulations, you're now proficient. It doesn't happen, right? Well, not often. So what it really is is a spectrum. Think of this as being just a continuum. And you can kind of judge where you might be in that continuum as you progress through the journey of learning something. So how does it all start off? Well, it starts off when you're a novice. When you're a novice, you don't know anything about the topic that you're, you're studying. Absolutely nothing. So really, there is nothing for you to put any kind of information, no framework for you to put any kind of information into. The only way you're gonna pick stuff up is either trial and error or by being told what to do. So imagine this is your first parachute jump. You're up in the plane and you're about to jump out. What would you rather do, trial and error? Or have someone tell you, pull this thing now, right? Pretty obvious. So, it's perfectly acceptable, it's perfectly good to take a novice and be incredibly directive with them. Do this, do that, do this. If you've ever taught someone to drive, first, God bless you. Um, <laughs> but second, you know that when you get a beginner behind the wheel, the last thing you want to do is to have some long involved you know, conversation about how internal combustion engines work, right? You don't even want to have any conversation, they certainly don't. Instead, they just want to go push this pedal, turn this wheel, and that's what you have to do. There comes a point, I love this, the Dreyfus brothers call this competent. I mean, can you imagine going home and saying, hey darling, I'm competent today. Um, no, but you're competent. Competent actually really means nothing much more than you have some situational knowledge. That means that you can say, if this, then this. Right? A set of basic rules that you can follow. So you're going to know that a note in this position on the staff means I hit this key. That's what competent is. 
The most difficult transition to make is when you transition from competent to proficient. Because when you are proficient, your knowledge becomes holistic. You actually see the big picture. And the big picture is way more complicated than you may have been led to believe when you first started. If you were a two-year-old and you're in that kind of you know, beginner stage, and you may be wandering around the house and you're toddling around and you're very happy and you think like you're master of the universe, right? You know everything. You can turn on the computer, you can play with the iPad. You know, everything is, is under your control. And then one day you go and you open the front door and you go, whoa, it's bigger than I thought it was, right? That is what it feels like to switch to being proficient. And this is the point at which most people stall. Most people give up learning when they have to make this stage from being directed to directing themselves. But if you stick with it, then you become an expert. The key mark of an expert is that you are intuitive. Your knowledge has become internalized to the point where you do things without thinking about them. Probably everybody here who drives is technically an expert driver in the driver's model because the chances are very good there have been days when you've driven to the store and not actually remember doing the driving. It's all internalized. In fact, it has to be. There is no way you could drive if you had to sit there and think, you know, okay, if I was to contract this muscle and contract this muscle and then extend this one, then I can turn the wheel a little bit. And if I turn, You can't do that. You have to just constantly be relaxed in your head driving. The last stage is mastery. And mastery is basically when you have become so intuitive that you're totally immersed in what you're doing. Some people call this state flow. So we have these levels where we have situational knowledge then holistic knowledge. We have our uh, intuitive understanding and turn, turns into our immersive understanding. And we can look at that in terms of the change in what we need. When we are just beginning, we need rules. We have to have rules. But as we get more and more sophisticated, our need for rules drops down. There have been many studies that have shown that if you make experts follow the rules that they themselves created, their performance drops. If you look at a, a, a classic example of that is pilots. They've done studies of pilots where they will look at a pilot who is training another pilot and they follow everything by the book and they measure their performance. On the next segment of the flight, they also then monitor that pilot when they're flying with an experienced pilot and they do things very differently. They're more efficient, they use less fuel, and they're probably a little bit safer as well. So experts do not take rules. Instead, the big difference is that we switch over to intuition. So there's this stepping stones that takes us from rules to intuition. And if intuition is kind of like too fuzzy a word, you could call it tacit knowledge. It's knowing things without knowing exactly how you know them or why you know them. As we teach people, I think this needs to be our objective. Back in the uh, 1911, I guess it was, Alfred Lord Mikehead said, it is profoundly erroneous truism repeated by all copybooks and eminent people when they are making speeches that we should cultivate the habit of thinking of what we are doing. The precise opposite is true. Civilization advances by extending the number of important operations we can perform without thinking. We need to work on ways of teaching people to make that transition, teaching people to move from the explicit, from the fact-based, into the tacit. Because only when knowledge is tacit can our experience become spontaneous. And we're talking about the now. Really, the only way to be in the now is not to be thinking about it, but to be experiencing it, to be reacting to it, to be doing it and creating it. And we can only do that if our knowledge and our experience and our actions are tacit, if they're inside ourselves. And I think the reason we do this, and the reason I so enjoy teaching and writing, 
is that if you can help people get to that stage, then what you are giving them, I think, is the greatest gift that a teacher can give anyone. You're giving people the gift of joy. Thank you.